evening, guys, and welcome to Digital Artcast. Uh, another episode uh, rounding out the year. We're getting close to the end of it. Um, thank God, I think, for a lot of people. Um, hoping you guys are keeping safe, uh, focusing on whatever projects you're focusing on, and keeping active and distracted while the world burns outside. Um, yeah, so again, uh, lots of messages from you guys uh, talking about uh you know the podcast is inspirational and it's kind of keeping you going during this dark time so that's great to hear i'm really pleased that uh you're finding some kind of happiness in the world even though there isn't a ton of it right now but of course um with art with painting um hopefully you can turn this uh this, these times or these these uh these uh, instances of what's going on into something positive either a painting or a sculpture um whatever you guys are doing um last couple episodes have been great we've had some good guests on um and we are continuing that theme with another one um we are lucky today to have uh, an extremely talented artist um who has produced some amazing works and had a great and uh you know very elaborate career over the the years so uh if you guys can welcome along today um one of the i think more amazing and uh, unique artists i've definitely had on this podcast um forrest the male hey forrest Hello, I'm here. Hello. You're here, you're present, yeah. you have made it. Yes, fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks for coming along and giving up your time. Um, that is a, an immense honour to have you here, to talk to you. Um, I know you're extremely busy these days with work and life in general, so um, it's great to have you along to talk to us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for all the, uh, all the praise. It, it, does, yeah. it does great for my ego. <laughs> I need it. Yes, of course you do. Um, well, I think the one thing that initially um, caught my attention with your work was the fact that you were, um, although, you know, not to make it sound condescending, but you're so young. You know, like, mm. I know in the grand scheme of things, you know, age is never a factor in the industry and it's all about your work. Um, but you've done a lot very early on, is what I mean. You know, like you've you've... You've climbed a lot of milestones. A lot of people will probably seek to climb, you know, in their thirties, forties, whatever. You know, like it's it's uh, you put a lot of dedication and time into your craft um, from a very early age. Like you were very focused quite early on, right? You were, you know, kind of already sure about, you know, even I think you talked about in your because uh, I've done your introduction course. Um, I don't know if you can remember you, you tweeted on one of my my uh, tweets where I took like a bunch of notes, like. I think like 16 pages of notes on one of your courses and you were like tweeting like, oh, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah, um, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was me. So <laughs> you'd be like, oh, that that guy. Um, but yeah, so uh, but then you were talking, I think even then about how, in, and then probably interviews you've done before where you had your career track pretty kind of sorted early on, right? You you had an idea already what you wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's really weird, um, and I'm super grateful for it. Uh, <laughs> but I knew I wanted to be an artist since kindergarten, um, wow. because I didn't, I just didn't know what kind of artist, right? It's like when you when you say you want to be a ninja as a kid, but you don't know like you don't know the nearest ninja school. You don't know like right. what it would take <laughs> to go and actually fucking do that as a as a career or anything. And so, yeah. uh, no, I I check i had to as an assignment in kindergarten we had to learn like how our library system worked at our school and okay. uh i i didn't want to read i hated reading because i i wasn't very good at it and right so i just went and found a book that had like the most pictures in it as possible and i found this uh old um it was like a book about poems based on mythical creatures okay. and uh somehow seeing that seeing that there was like a book that pr like primarily had photos in it it clicked into my mm -hmm. head that like oh uh, someone had to draw this and mm -hmm. they they did that as like a job therefore right. that's what i want to do um right and uh and then from there i ended up having like i think just a, a small bit of like natural inclination towards talent for drawing um right and so uh, a lot of what actually drove my uh, desire to become an artist was actually, I know I said it jokingly earlier, but I think there's just a kernel of truth to it is that like it's ego based is like, 
I think mm. early on as a kid, a lot of other kids knowing me as being like the art kid at school or whatever. Um, right. It's like after after you get known uh, in in your small group or vicinity as as that um it's what you want to be like known as it's like that's how i got praised so that's what i kept doing um, right and yeah. then eventually i decided well maybe i should actually try and make a career out of this <laughs> yeah i mean well i mean i think it's very common no, well not very common but i do i know people like that but i also think of myself you know i know there's an ego boost when i publish stuff and people are like oh that's really good and I'm like, oh great, yay! Because I think, I think that's also because in generalities we're very self-deprecating as artists, you know. Where you look at your own stuff and think, oh, I don't, you know, oh, I don't think that's very good. But it takes other people to see your work to then be like, oh no, it is good. Like, you know, don't worry about it. You know, you are doing the right thing. Um, because that also then encourages you to move forward, right? That's probably why you kept getting better and better because you obviously wanted to just keep that feeling being a constant through your life right i mean i think that it actually uh, it's not good but naturally mm -hmm. i have the opposite inclination i think and in that when i draw something i tend to i tend to like it um and i actually ah, need okay. someone to criticize it for me to get out of my head um i don't right. like think i'm the best at what i'm doing or anything but it's very much like i i'm, I'm able to kind of let myself go and just be like no i think like this thing that i made is cool which I like okay. that I have that part of me that's like that, but oh, thank God, <laughs> right? It, but yeah. I also know I've seen the opposite. Like I've seen it in its extreme, where right. if someone has that personality trait, they can let it completely overwhelm them, and they just can't take criticism. Um, right. And for me, I've learned to really, really encourage and and, and trust in uh, certain levels of criticism in order to get anywhere because. Yeah, I've, I've had times where like my ego's gotten ahead of me and then, right. you know, I fall flat on my face because of it. Um, mm. And so, uh, yeah, I I tend to like safely be self-deprecating. Like, like right. I, I could like something, but I know that there's things wrong with it. I'm sure there are things that could be improved because if right. I'm not at least honest about that, then soon i'm gonna start thinking i'm the shit and that i can do whatever i want and that like i'm, I'm the greatest <laughs> yeah i mean it's kind of like i mean when you watch a lot of those old like um like van halen you know interviews and you listen to the guys years later they're always like yeah like you know we we always thought we were the shit that's why we acted like that because you know we wanted to be confident in our interviews and seem like we were doing well because then more people would come to our, our concerts and it's like i think and also when you're producing any kind of creativity you've got to kind of be like a little bit cocky because then you're not going to sell right you're not going to you know throw yourself in front of art directors and be like oh, i mean you could hire me but like i don't know i'm kind of shit i don't know you know what i mean like if you start that way then people would automatically be like well why the fuck are you sitting in front of me like what's the point so like yeah you've got to have some element of that i think if you're if you're confident as an artist it, it does help a lot it does get it opens more doors i think than people who are a bit more um introverted you know what i mean yeah, it if that I makes think, sense. Yeah, I think it really. You just need a balance of of ego and a balance of mm -hmm. of humbleness. I think I I talked with a friend of mine recently that um he he summarized it to you should always have a mentor and you should always have someone you're mentoring, um right and in that way you're you're humbled but you're also um reminded of how much you've learned and able to pass that on. Ah, um, okay. And I think that you kind of need that balance. Like if if you are the top of your hierarchy of learning, like then mm -hmm. how are you going to improve and understand what you need to work on? And you can see that yeah. from artists at all varying skill levels and that I've seen artists that are I mean technically in the grand scheme of things uh, like fairly low skill level but because mm -hmm. they are generally surrounding themselves with people of lower skill level, um, mm -hmm. they you can kind of get this sense of ego from them. You get this sense that like they believe they're much better than they than they truly are, or that like right. they they understand a lot more uh, fundamental knowledge than they maybe actually have a good grasp on. Um, and I, it's like that's just more stuff that feeds into the ego. Yeah, I mean, a vicious cycle, if anything. But I think it's also difficult where I find, or I've found the four years, you know, I've been, you know, knee deep, knee deep in the industry. Um, mentors are a hard thing to come by. I think mentees, like, 
come by the hundreds but like finding someone that will dedicate time and energy to helping you improve um i mean i suppose that in that sense there are paid options but it's hard to find i think just someone in general that you can talk to higher up you know i mean i've been lucky i've been i've came from an industry where like people talk all the time and they're very open and you know everybody's on the same kind of level so I've never had a problem. You know, that's why the podcast has worked the last couple of years is because I've just, I just reach out to people. I just, you know, uh, even though there's nothing scheduled, but like I have, I have, you know, just emailed Doug Chang at one point, you know, and been like, you want to come on and do an interview? You know, some people would even say, oh, I could, I could never, I could never, you know, send an email to Doug Chang. Like, why would I? But these are just like, you know, they're people like everybody else. Even when we had Scott Robertson on the podcast, people were like, how the hell? And I'm like, I just asked him. <laughs> I just like walked yeah. up to him and was like, do you want to come on the podcast? So, I mean, it's the same with uh, pushing yourself for work or putting stuff out there. Like, you just have to be a little bit cocky because that will definitely make you seem more attractive to art directors than anything else. Um, they will see that at least you have the confidence to put stuff out and be like, well, this is a good piece. And I know what, you know, I know what, you know, standards are and i know that my stuff hits that standards and that it's no terrible and i'm taking my time and understanding the process so i think it's a good thing to have um i mean you're definitely a rare breed you're probably one of the people i know you know the hundreds of artists i've met that you know pe- a person who has confidence in their work because it, it typically is like you said you know people who are like oh, i hate my work it's crap it's uh, so i mean good on you great for you i mean that definitely would help and i mean but that's probably why you've had such success probably really early on is because you were very confident in your work. Well, so, I mean, cause you were, well, yeah, well, you can talk about that. Yeah. Maybe it, I, I misphrased it. Cause I don't want to make it seem like I had too much confidence in my work. Um, because yeah, it was, it, it was more so like, I, I think I generally try to phrase it as a uh, naivety, like, um, right. In that, uh, I think what stops a lot of people, in their tracks when working on art is Mm -hmm. um, the it's, it's all of the information coming at them and all of the skill level is this mountain in front of them. That is just so daunting. And of course, I think I just had the, like the dumb, like naive, uh, I, I don't know, charisma or whatever you want to call it to just keep going. And like, not because like, I thought that I was really great or anything like that, but just kind of, cause I was right. like, well, what else am I going to do? Like, like I right. might as well keep, keep this up. But mm-hmm. it's like now when I, when I finish images, um, like I'm, I just finished this, uh, uh, one illustration recently for, for mm-hmm. riot. And it's like, I can look at it and be like, yeah, you know, like there are things I like, but like, there's plenty of things that I want to work on and improve on. So I think really it's just, I try to view everything through this kind of gray lens um, right. where it's like, there are things that I can enjoy about this thing, but there are things that I really need to improve on and work on. And, and those are the things I'll take with me into the next image. Um, and that's exactly what happened is I worked on one and now I'm working on a second right. one, took the lessons that I learned from that first one to work on the second one. And, and I'm liking the results a lot better, but now the second one has other things that I'm like, Oh yeah, like I, I should, you know, improve this or work on this or whatever. Yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you're never going to be a master. Well, I say a master, but then how do you do it? That's even like a whole conversation in itself, right? What defines a master painter? What defines a master artist? You know, I think, like, you'll never be at the point where you know everything. Of course, that's just that's just obvious. But, uh, you know, I think there's a level you can eventually get to where you're like, well, I'm a good artist. I mean, I don't think, I think what you're trying to avoid is sounding like a pompous asshole, right? You don't want right. to come on the podcast and sound like, Oh, I'm the shit, my stuff's the best, and of course I'm feeding you, you go sing your stuff's incredible, but you are very talented, you know, and I hate, I even hate that word talent, because I know it's not talent, it's hard work, but, you know, you're very good at what you do, you're, you're, you know, for the age range for artists that are usually your level, you're a lot younger than typically people are at that age, so I mean, I think it's just impressive to see how much you've accomplished from, you know, from where you've started to where you are now, because, you know, like you said, you've just finished a piece for Riot, I mean, for people like Riot Games is like the mecca, you know, that's like the angle, that's like, you know, somewhere you hit, you know, when you've been, you know, in loads of other different companies and painting for years and years. I mean, you have, obviously, but then, um, I mean, because you, I, I can't remember specifically, for us, but how old are you right now? I'm, t- how old am I? Oh, I'm 26. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, so, so mid twenties essentially. But then like that's what I'm saying, you know, people a lot of people I know they got their break at riot at like, you know, thirty four, thirty six, you know, maybe even closer to forty, you know, then where you know, in their twenties they were probably on like like their first job, right? Like their first, you know, indie studio or their, you know, they were straight out of uni, they were into their first couple of gigs in some smaller uh, companies. Yeah. Then you build, and probably in your 30s, you hit the AAA space if you've been, you know, working up. So, um, so yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I do know people obviously your age as well who have done incredible things also, but it's, but it's rare. Like you're, you're the exception of the rule. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think um, it's, but, I, I think generally it's because most people end up thinking about what they want to do after high school. Um, and I, right. I was lucky enough to have some sort of a glimpse at what I might want to do, um, before, yep. uh, high school. And so like I started mm-hmm. when I was like 13, 14, um, right. just about to go into high school. And like, that's when I got my first anatomy book and started joining online art communities and stuff. Um, yeah, I think I, I, my skills really started skyrocketing after high school because that's when I was able to dedicate more and more time throughout the day. Time, yeah. Yeah, Um, but yeah, it, I mean, I, I didn't start fresh out of high school, right? I, I already kind of, Of I was getting very small, uh, pay freelance work, like 25, $35 commissions or whatever. But like that was, it was something, you know, something to go off in the beginning course yeah i mean like um, it's definitely you know because i think you've had all the the major illustration works anyway or the major publishers you know like you said like you know you've got riot games magic the gathering you know you've just done i think you've just done your first hearthstone card um you know various other pools that are like for people you know for people like one of those would be enough you know what i mean like you know like right. building all that time then working for magic or building all that time working on riot you know but like you're hitting multiple points on different big companies so it's it's uh i know i need to stop talking like this because i feel like i'm just <laughs> i feel like i'm just asking and constantly but i'm not but like that's the reason i want to join because i think what i'm trying to dig to the the real the root of initially um and try to build this whole conversation for the next hour is like can we piece or no piece together but maybe pick apart what are the key traits you feel have led to where you are because i definitely want to cover you know like having just done your beginner course I feel like there's a lot of things that could break apart in there. And the fact that, you know, you've now probably yourself, of course, that's why you made the course. You've looked back and thought, well, what are the things I think are most important to focus on? Where are the key elements people really should be putting their time into? Um, because I think it's been an episode, you know, we've not had a really good episode where someone has went over the old mantras of like, well, this is what you need to do if you want to be a good illustrator. This is what you need to do if you want to learn anatomy, if you want to learn color theory, you know, like, these are the key points. Right. Um, I take it that that was the the idea behind the beginner series, right? You were you were wanting to really break apart those ideas and and give them to the world, basically. Yeah, it was uh, it was stuff that I had been like spouting on about uh, forever on my live streams, and and eventually right. just decided like you know, like instead of just expecting some people that are you know starting out with this to come and watch me happen to be streaming on this specific time because i do it very yeah. spontaneously um i should just make so i i basically wanted to make a course that like i kind of wish that i had um starting out mm-hmm. and i didn't feel like there was anything out there at the moment that i could find yet that still kind of scratched that itch and i don't even know if what i right. made was really enough of that um i think that if i if if it's an ideal course if i really had like enough time to put into it i would have made it a lot more interactive and more of like a proper mentorship that you could follow along with um right but i think starting out on like like i started at conceptart.org um Mm -hmm. and that was uh, every every art community kind of has their own like general thing that they end up praising and i think it's usually started from the like top hierarchies of artists that belong there um, and so when I joined um, conceptart.org, a lot of people um, would just praise and praise uh, anatomy or old master studies. Like old master studies was like one of the biggest things. Um, and then joining, you know, a place like uh, Crimson Daggers, suddenly it became not so much what you're studying, but how you're studying. Um, and so right. I learned a lot by joining all of these different kind of ecosystems of artists and like how, uh, like trying to absorb what they are generally like thinking and and spouting and talking about with Mm -hmm. one another. Um, But uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I think what what frustrates me more than anything is when someone tells someone like, oh, you should study anatomy or you should do old master studies um, right. and not explaining how you should do them or what you're trying to get out of it. Like it's so, it's so right. stupid to me when someone's like, oh yeah, you should paint more like Sargent paintings. It's like, what do you expect anyone to get from that? Like you don't know, like I remember as a beginner, like it took me two years before I learned what the entire like philosophy or idea of construction in anatomical terms, like what that meant for learning. Mm. So if that took me two years to learn, how does anyone expect me to figure out, like just from saying paint more Sargent paintings, how am I supposed to understand, like, what is that going to benefit me? Like, what am I supposed to learn yeah. from doing those things? Um, yeah. And you need, I think, really proper guidance and you need someone that it's just difficult for people that have been doing this for many years and have had like their own kind of paths that uh, they've taken to then try and reel themselves back and try and think of things from a beginner mindset. Um, mm. And it's, it's really, really hard for me to, I tried to do it as best as possible when working on that series, but it, once you've learned something, it's so hard to think about a space that you were once in where you didn't know those things and then how to teach it again. Yeah. Um. And so that's kind of what I was trying to do with that series. Yeah. I mean, like, where do you start in essence? Because there's there's so much to teach, and I think even you know I definitely feel I feel like your course has has definitely been one of the better, if not the best, approach to beginning art than I've seen in most you know CGMA classes or other things that are offered. I think you're very uh, loose in what you talk about, but at the same time, very specific where, you know, you talk generalities of like learning art, but then specifically you're like, well, you know, for characters specifically, you would want to, you know, learn this. Or if you're doing environments, look at this color studies. I think it's definitely a good way to break it down, but it's hard to, to find time to make something involved because there's just so much to teach, right? There's, you know, anatomy, you could have a whole, you know six to eight week course on just anatomy like the, you know the, when you go to atelier schools for instance you know people go there for years at a time and spend like up to nearly you know three four hours at a time painting or, or drawing one study because you know it's such a specialized school but that's just for anatomy you, you know outside of that then you've got environments props you know every, there's so much to learn it's almost impossible to break it down and cover everything in one course that's what i'm saying you know like so i think for what time you had available and for what you were probably trying to put together at the time i think it was it was definitely a good uh cover of everything in one go i think you, you know you tried to cover as many big points as you could um especially when it came to color as well because that's something i've really struggled with as well and i think you did a good job of breaking that down because it's always one thing or the other that breaks down your pieces it's always like well your anatomy is solid but like you have zero understanding of composition or your anatomy and composition is good but the colors are terrible right. you know so it's like trying to cover all those things and once is hard but i think the way i've found anywhere the way i've found that i've accelerated a little bit quicker or, or, or at least improved in some generality is that i try to break things down into their core elements so if i'm going to learn you know anatomy i'll just focus on anatomy for so long i won't you know even look at color initially or i mean it's got to be there eventually but anatomy has such a, right, a wide range that spending two weeks on just anatomy would never be a waste of time because there is so much to learn so if you break it down into smaller chunks like you know for these two weeks i'll do anatomy then i'll do a bit of color studies then i'll do a bit you know so i, th I mean it, do you find that's the good way to learn things as well as just in chunks like that or i mean i think so i think it's chunks but it's also just really really particular focused learning um at, right. at least that's that's how i've learned like i, I know a lot of people learn very very differently and so mm -hmm. I, I always have to preface that it's like, this is what I did. And like, I don't know what's going to work and how someone else is going to learn um, better. There's a lot of people that they claim that like, you know, watching, watching a lot of YouTube tutorials and watching other artists work, like helps them a lot. I mm -hmm. don't learn that way, really. Like I can learn right. techniques that way, but I don't really learn like fundamental knowledge that way. Um, I have to really get in and like start a painting myself and try and apply those techniques uh, or those ideas into something I'm working on myself. Um, right. But uh, yeah, very like specific focus studies. So it's not just like, oh, I'm going to work on anatomy for a bit. Like one thing I did recently is like 
I think for basically three weeks straight, like every day, I just was drawing um, skulls or Asaro heads um, mm -hmm. from different angles and then drawing okay. them from my imagination at, at a different angle as well. Um, and uh, okay. I wasn't, I, and what I was trying to focus on a lot was trying to capture the major forms of the head um, or of the mm -hmm. skull and how to imply those as best as possible from mm -hmm. uh, whatever angle I'm seeing the head at. Um, and that's like one very, very specific element of drawing and drawing anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I would needed to work on. And then from, from there, you know, I, I need to learn how do I then take the smaller shapes of the head, like the eyes and the nose and the mouth, and how do I make those conform properly to whatever the perspective is that I'm viewing it from. And so like, that's now what I'm having to work on af after that. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just, you know, it's constantly trying to be very critical or the way I saw it is I have a friend that's like, you know, unapologetically critical of my work. And so okay. like having, you know, I think that's the whole mentor mentee, uh, type, type thing, right. Is, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, him and I try to help each other out a lot, but he, he'll, you know, generally criticize my drawing. And like, I might mention something about like his rendering every now and then or something, but like, we try to, you know, help, help each other out in that capacity. But, um, yeah, you kind of, you kind of need to always either be critical of yourself or have someone else from the outside, look at your work and help you figure out how to, how or what to be critical of for your own work, uh, in order to know what to specifically focus on and study. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I remember having a conversation with a couple of guys at Lightbox last year and I remember one artist whose name I cannot remember, but he made such a great point is that one of the key things I think that people don't realize is great when you're a starting artist is having the ability to work out by yourself what you need to work on, you know, cause so many people will come in portfolios and be like, Oh, you know, I've been painting for a year and I just don't know where like my stuff is missing. And I think that's almost a skill in itself is to look at your stuff, you know, from an outside view and think, well, where am I falling down? What is it that's holding me back? And, because that's something that all people can't answer by themselves. You know, they need someone to be, pick and like you say, the mentee thing is great because, you know, if you have someone above you who's like, well, you know, this is great, but your anatomy's off, blah, blah. So I think the more you can develop that skill, the quicker you would probably accelerate because then, you know, you know where to focus. But it is one of the harder skills to teach, right? To be able to look at your stuff and be aware, like super aware about what is holding you back or what particular in a piece is wrong, right? Yeah, I, I mean... I honestly can't do it without other people. Like I, right. I can be as critical as I want to my own stuff and say like, you know, yeah, I think, uh, you know, this form is off anatomically or I mm -hmm. like, it's very clear what's wrong with your work. If right. you're trying to do something and it's not looking right, then right. I try to make a mental note or write it down and understand that like, okay, I'm struggling getting this to look right. This is something I need to brush up on. So that's a very easy way of identifying it before you actually finish a piece of, of what you need to work on. But otherwise, like if you're working on something and you think it's fine, but you think it could be better, but you're not sure how it could be better then like, I, mm. I can't do it without other people. And I actually think about, yeah. um, I've been getting a lot into game design lately and that's what I do. in mm -hmm. like my spare time is I, I design uh, like board games for fun. Um, okay. And doing, doing that has offered a lot of interesting cross-discipline um, things in order to try and, uh, so I'm, I'm going to use this in an attempt to communicate what, what I mean with, with art and, and needing other people. Right. Um, the, one of the most boring things to do is play a game by yourself. And so if you're going to design a game for other people to play in a group with, you need other people in order to know what that game needs for the most part. Right. There's only some, yeah. th there's only enough things you can do for yourself before you need to bring people in from the outside and get their perspective. Um, and not that you can't still make art for yourself, so to speak, but if you're speaking from a commercial mindset, and what you're trying to work on is get better for doing, you know, magic work or riot work or whatever, then mm -hmm. really, you know, uh, I'm not saying forget what kind of art you want to do or anything like that, but just like know that what you need to work on is the fundamentals. And in order to find mm -hmm. out what fundamentals you need to brush up on, 
um, there's only so much you can understand yourself and you'll need to bring other people in because it's other people that are going to be looking at your work in the end anyway. That's who you're making it for as a commercial artist yeah. is for other people. Yeah, of course. And I think it's like you said, it's when you're stuck in the bubble sometimes of just doing your own stuff, it is hard to to be um, self-aware of what's going on in the painting because uh, you can only stand back so so far beyond you know your own stuff before you need to bring someone else in. And I think that's almost what's good about things like, you know, the art communities that, you know, like a lot of people have discords now or patrons or loads of stuff like that where, um, you know, feedback is almost, you know, a click away. You know, you don't have to really look at it, um, you know, or, or, you know, even forms like you don't have to go online to forms and meet people, you know, for a lot of these, you know, if you had a favorite artist, particularly if you had someone that uh, you really admired and they had a, you know, a patron or a discord, you know, that stuff is, is, you know, almost invaluable. It's, it's like stuff that, you know, when I left my job in 2012, like art station wasn't even a thing. You know what I mean, so, right. or, you know, a lot of online discords and stuff that we have now that's, you know, that's very available. So I think you're almost living in a time where um, it's like information overload. We talked about this, I think, um, uh, the last episode where, you know, one of the problems for learning as well is that there's so much information out there, right? There's just, you know, no hundreds, but there is, you know, there's a ton of art schools. There's a lot of people selling, you know, courses or feedback. And, mm. you know, I think that's also a problem is like, where do you focus? Like, where do you put your attention? Because it's so much, you know, it's so overwhelming to try and take everything in at once. Like, how do you manage that? And I think that's your, where your course stands alone. And it's, you know, that it's good that you broke down those particular subjects. But do you feel like that's a, a problem you see in a lot of people now? Is that like, I know it's a problem I've had is like wanting to do everything. Was that something as well that you've seen in people like when they've came to your portfolios is that they try to do too much? I mean, it's something that I've yeah had issues with even in the past for sure. Like oh, okay, I, cool. I see it uh, <laughs> all the time still and that it's, it's not even necessarily wanting to do multiple disciplines um, mm -hmm. at, at the same time. And it's just when you're starting out, when, when I see a portfolio that, um, is someone and they're trying to, they're basically trying to do like a magic, the gathering illustration for their portfolio. Right. It's like, that's completely mm -hmm. understandable and you should totally get practice in trying to bring some illustration to final. But right. when I see a portfolio that's, that's doing that, but, and I see how many fundamentals they still need to brush up on before they can really bring their final illustration here to like magic the gathering level. Um, right. It's how I know that like, it, that this person is trying to think about all of these things at the same time or, or throughout the image making process. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they need to kind of chunkify that, that information, you know, and like keep it, uh, and, and organize it and consolidate their, their thought process as they work through it. Because yeah. the, the worst thing is trying to make an image and, and thinking about, um, I mean, the way I label the, the fundamentals as composition, anatomy, perspective, uh, color mm -hmm. and light and value. Um, mm -hmm. and thinking about all of those things simultaneously when you only have, you know, a beginner's level knowledge of it is just so frustrating. Um, yeah. and so I, I always, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience. Like I did all of that shit like forever. Like, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I absolutely am, am that person as well. But, um, right. uh, I think it, what helped me a lot was when I started thinking of things as, as separate fundamentals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I used to, for instance, like if I did an illustration of like a lizard person, you know, in, in mm -hmm. a forest, this I'm using an example that I've done in the past. Um, right. Then I remember at that time I, I did studies of forests. I did studies of lizards and I, I wasn't thinking about the separate fundamentals, right? I was just thinking about the topics themselves. Like I was thinking like, how do I paint a lizard? Well, I will paint a lizard and I will find out. But right. when you're able to break down what that really means, you know, like, okay, well, what is a lizard? Well, it's, it's, it's anatomy. And then what is the texture? Well, the texture is technically value or light. And then mm -hmm. beyond that, you know, you get into color, which is dependent somewhat on the light. And when you're able to chunk that information and think of it in these in these separate steps, it takes a lot longer um, in, in order to do a single image, for instance, if you're trying to do it like in your own time, 
but mm -hmm. you're able to see everything under that lens at some point, right? You're able right. to eventually dissect things or objects that you see, you know, in real life or in your paintings or whatever as as a drawing or as a group of values um, or, mm -hmm. or whatever you might you might see it as. And so I think right. trying to get people to really, really hone in and have um, like a focus whenever they're working on something um, and not just noodle noodle away at it in hopes that it's going to look better in the end is, is always what I recommend. So, I mean, you, in essence, I think you're kind of saying that you can study these things separately, but then probably the better way to to study them is, you know, can, uh, doing a finished piece that would incorporate multiple aspects of them, right? So you would do, you know, if you were doing individual atme stuff for so long and then you've done so much color work, you would, you would culminate that in doing like some kind of, uh, you know, finished painting or piece that would incorporate all those things, right? I mean, I think that that is really good practice in order to, to, you know, eventually be able to do that. But I think it's, it's right. more important that I, I know like one way that I used to start my paintings is like, I would start it with paint, for instance, like I would try and do like the drawing step by kind of blocking things in and not, I'm not trying to hark on like technique by any means. I think you can start it however you want, but if you're starting out, yeah, if yeah. you're just learning um, mm -hmm. in the beginning, I think um trying to it, it, let's say you're learning in the beginning right and you're trying to focus on um on drawing mm -hmm. then not not just drawing from your imagination a whole bunch trying to get it right or right. even drawing from reference but like figure out what makes up the drawing that you are attempting to make and right. draw that from reference and then draw that from imagination. And then if you mm. feel like you still don't quite have it, go back, draw more from reference and then draw from imagination. Ah, right, okay. I'm and, you now. Yeah. and keep doing that until you understand like, okay, this is what makes up this thing I'm trying to draw. Right. And like, right. And I, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Cause like I said, it take, it's going to take a long time to do right. an illustration that way. But like the things that you'll learn, um, mm -hmm. from making yourself do those extra steps um, mm -hmm. it's it's just insane I don't know yeah I mean like in essence I think what you're talking about is something that um, my friend Antonio also teaches where you know he has a, he has a, a challenge well a, a website called Artwad which is artwork out of the day where he teaches people every single day what to basically paint or draw like he has a set kind of program but he believes very fundamentally and I actually I kind of believe this myself actually I don't know if you agree but he believes that a solid drawn foundation, like people who are like, you know, really good draftsmen, people who can really draw, um, lay a much better foundation for everything else they do in the entertainment industry. You know, if you can draw extremely well, your paintings will probably have a more solid base. You know, you'll be able to get ideas across more quickly. You know, just the fundamentals will be more, uh, or, or the end result will look better because of that underlying drawing ability. Do you think, do you feel like that's the same? Do you feel like drawn specifically plays a stronger part if you're good at it initially? So my personal belief with my own work mm -hmm. and my own tendencies is that mm -hmm. I I tend to recommend drawing more. And I, I personally have a lot of care um, and attention put into drawing over, over other steps. Um, right. However, I do think that we're... Uh, when talking about that, I'm viewing it very mm -hmm. much from a commercial mindset. Um, right. In that if I'm doing a League of Legends illustration, you know, um, or splash art for some other company or whatever, then like, yes, I do think getting that solid drawing foundation in there is going to make that image better. But that is, you know, be, that is dependent on what you're working on. Right. Um, right. Whereas I've seen plenty of pieces of art um, that the drawing ability is not like solid in the way that we're describing as solid, right. And that it doesn't have proper right. perspective or form, or it's not even necessarily anatomically correct, but right. I don't think it necessarily hinders the image as a whole. Right. I think that comes down yeah. to taste. And yeah. so it's, it's, it's tough because I mean, I think that uh, commercially speaking, depending on what you're working on, like, yes. Um, I think, it, it's good to be able to have the skills of solid anatomy, but at the same time, you also need to understand like 
when it maybe is acceptable to break those rules um, yeah. in order to get something that would be considered maybe more interesting anatomy. I mean, I just did, I just wrapped up this job that was about three months long or so. Um, thank right. God. But uh, <laughs> it was a very specific style that the client was looking for. And mm -hmm. I purposefully had to kind of go back a bit on my, my tendencies of correct anatomy and instead focus a bit more because these were uh, dialogue illustrations for characters and so mm -hmm. it was much more um it, it was much better for the for the game if the dialogue illustrations looked interesting and had very nice cool silhouettes but sometimes that would break the proper form of the drawing um right and so it's it's instances like that that I think it's more it's better to consider the medium that you're uh that you're trying to bring these illustrations to life in um mm -hmm in order to decide like what is what is most important um i do think though that like yes i would say drawing is is one of the most like you know primary of fundamentals skills. of all yeah i've yeah. seen i've seen plenty like and not to call any any out but like mm -hmm. you know i've seen i've seen plenty of splash illustrations that you know i look at and i'm like this is the most pretty painted broken anatomically like <laughs> thing i've ever yeah, seen yeah, yeah. um yeah and and you know i i do think that it would make things stronger a lot of the times but yeah i don't i don't i just don't want to say it as like a hard solid rule consistent yeah. throughout all of art well i mean you preface that stuff always with well this is my opinion i mean like you know if you don't agree if someone didn't agree with your your opinion well that's fine opinions are fine everybody can have opinions but then you know as long as you're not maybe coming across being like yeah, you have to learn to draw. If you can't draw well, then you're never going to make it as an artist. You know, when you start talking like that, I suppose then people would be like, "Well, what the fuck?" You know, well, like, yeah. But I, oh, I've well. heard artists talk like that, so that's what. I oh, okay, want to well, <laughs> luckily I've not. But yeah, I suppose there is people out there. But you know, like I think I, I definitely for the the show again. I'm very inexperienced compared to you, right? And I've only been in the industry a couple of years, and you know that. 2016 was when I went to my first event and you know I graduated two years ago so I'm still a baby in that essence even though I'm 35 but like you know like the things I have seen I think have been accelerated because I've went to multiple events all over the world I've run this podcast for four years I've got to speak to people like you and Scott Robertson and all these people and I definitely have seen um tent poles like common things that line up that are like if these are solid then you're kind of on to a winner and no matter how many times I've looked at stuff like even stuff like photo bashing or 3D or other techniques that are used in the industry, the people I've seen who are at the tip of the top of the, the hill who do some of the best work for the biggest clients are people who like, you know, have an absolutely solid base and foundations, which is like drawn anatomy, light, composition, color, you know, the stuff that typically people will ignore because they want to get to the juicy part at the end, right? They want to have the cool splash art the concept piece but then of course when you try to make stuff like that and those other things are lacking you know yourself it will fall down and you look at it and be like i mean well it's half decent but like you know if you had a better understanding of composition it could be like really decent so um i think what you're saying isn't to really isn't really to, to shun a certain group or anything i think saying something like having a solid foundation of drawing will help you as an artist is just a general like you kind of really should you know do those kind of things because then you want to you know if you, if you're if your end goal is to be a concept art or illustrator i do think drawn is something you should focus on but again my opinion that's your opinion <laughs> it's no set in stone so i mean because i know people who you know i know people who work in some studios who can you know draw traditionally but they can full bash in 3d and paint their way out of a corner so their stuff looks you know good right. so it's like you know you can uh, you can have those jobs and have those skill sets and 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 get work, but um, I think it's more just like see for me personally, I think I'm just a purist, right? Like I grew up around cartoons all my life, and when I was really really young, like my, I always remember telling or my mom telling me this story. But when I was really young, I was like, I wanted to draw the turtles, I wanted to draw cartoons, I wanted to draw He Man, you know, Thundercats. Like that was like my initial goal was was something that involved uh, pencil and, and ink drawing because you know also love comic books when I was younger, so. I think for my particular style, especially because I want to work even in stylized stuff eventually, um, drawing would be important to me. But then if like, you know, you're going to work in, uh, you know, places like ILM or NPC uh, or a lot of those uh, maybe film VFX places, I know that you can use 
enough 3D, enough photo bashing that you can get the job done. So, you know, because the directors at the time wouldn't really care what the end result is as long as it fits the purpose. It, you know, it's it's to the standard that they need it to be for a, a visual piece. So I think it always is dependent on where you want to go work, right? If you want to work for Riot Games, if you want to work for Magic the Gathering, there's certain things you would need in your portfolio or need as a skill set to get there, right? Right. And that's that's where I think it's it's really interesting. Um the the thing that kind of opened my my mind to this stuff was um interacting and talking with artists that um work for themselves uh primarily. Right. Um mm-hmm. because it, it's it's so fascinating when you can when you can meet or talk with an artist that like is doing much better than commercial artists that you know um mm-hmm. that uh don't give as much a shit about like certain fundamentals, right? Like they don't care as much right. about like the drawing, like they care about other aspects of, of painting, but it's the aspects mm-hmm. that they personally care about. Um, yeah. And talking to more artists like that. Um, yeah, I, I think it, what you said is probably a good way of putting it is that it's very dependent on who you want to work for, but that includes working for yourself and that yes. if, if who you want to work for is yourself and you want to do the things that you want to do, then focus on the aspects of the painting that you really care about. Um, yes. and, and from there, it's about, you know, it's more about marketing and, and keeping an audience uh, interested yeah. in your work. But um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, you don't want to, you don't want to say to people that, you know, your way is wrong. I, I think what is interesting, and, and again, I was doing this, you know, I'm, 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 at the moment, I'm I'm feeding back to a bunch of students from my former university. Like I'm helping them kind of get through some certain pieces, and you know, because I know enough now that like I can tell like an absolute beginner like some basic stuff that will be correct because I've spoken to enough people. You know, I know like oh, you should focus on this or really look at this. You know, like you know, even though I'm no technical proficient, I know the general knowledge is like to focus. You know, or if you want to learn anatomy, check this person out. If you want to do that, you know. Right. So, but what what I've said to them is like. Every artist in the world, outside of the entertainment industry, you know, every artist in the world is different. You know, some people who even paint, some people prefer acry- acrylics over oil paints or gouache or, you know what I mean, watercolor. Even within one discipline of painting, there's four different ways to approach the materials. So, like, the beautiful thing about art is that everybody is unique, right? Everybody, No two people or two artists will typically have the same process or pipeline from making an, an image, you know, whether it's 3D or 2D or photo bash, 3D, you know, there's so many ways to approach stuff that as long as the end result is good and is competent enough, you will find work. So, you know, and I think I was saying this because people, especially now in university, they were so uh, software agnostic, you know, they were like, they were wanting to be like, oh, should I learn Blender? Should I learn this? And I'm like, it's like you said, whatever you feel is applicable to what you want to do, then learn that. Because you don't have to really have a standard. You don't really have to do the thing that everybody else is doing if you feel like you can get a good result with your methods. Um, and I think that's what I like about this industry is because, you know, I always say like the thing that I loved about the podcast was you could ask the question to someone, how did you get into the industry? And every single person has a different story. Because there's no real set way to be an artist in this industry. There's no real set way to be an artist, full stop. That's what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, artists are unique in various various aspects of the work, but especially when it comes to entertainment, because there's so many different disciplines and things that need images for it, whether it's advertising or commercial or film or, you know, video games, they've all got different avenues. So yeah. I, ideally, you just want to stick to the one thing you love doing. Because, yeah. Oh, no, you go. On you go. Yeah. I think it's funny that uh, you mentioned the the software agnosticism and that like right. I uh, I was at um gosh the last workshop I went to um I can't remember how long ago it was I think it was like two years ago it was the massive black workshop I was having okay. a discussion with um some of the students that were at the school that was hosting I think it was DigiPen up in in, in Washington and um uh I remember talking to them. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I just was so curious because at that time I was working on the the fundamental series and I thought like, okay, well, here's an opportunity for me to actually like talk to people that are starting out, so to speak, that are like early on in development. So I really right. wanted to know like, okay, where's your mind at? What are you thinking about? Um, mm-hmm. What are you being taught? Um, and it, it was funny because I got immediately that sense of, of what you're saying in that... Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, one of the students, they didn't like know me, like they didn't, they didn't know like that I was currently working or that I had a career. I looked their age. I probably was their age. So like, right. they probably thought I was yeah. like someone asking as potentially trying to become a student or anything like that. So it's, it's right. fine. Yeah. But mm-hmm. they, uh, uh, they told me that they're like, uh, all about Houdini, which I'd never heard of. I get, have you heard of Houdini? It's mm-hmm. like a program. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I'm an old man. I'm young, but like I, I'm a grumpy, <laughs> I'm a grumpy old man as far as industry stuff goes. And so like they were talking to me about Houdini oh, yeah. and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that is. And they're like, right. you don't know what Houdini is. It's a must have <laughs> for the industry. Like if you don't know Houdini, like good luck making it in this business. Oh, and I'm okay. like, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh very you, you you go far yeah with your drawing man sure. yeah i i'm i'm done i'm a caveman at this yeah. point but i you know yeah. and i didn't correct them i wasn't gonna make them feel like an asshole or anything like that but <laughs> you know I, I told them that i kindly disagree and that you know like i i think that there's plenty of space for people that have traditional uh skills or fundamentals or whatever and yeah um uh, but yeah it's just interesting that like uh, i think it was all of the i think it was three of them that i was talking with like all of them were basically under the same um the the same mindset and i i thought like okay the only reason they're under this mindset is because they were told to be under this mindset and that's what's frustrating when 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 discussing it it's like i don't blame them for saying what they said i blame a teacher yeah. for teaching them that this is the way to think and that's what's yeah. aggravating, I think, and why it, it again, it's another reason I really wanted to make that fundamental series is because like of course. I, I think that as much as I think it's important for you to try and have someone to mentor you, so to speak, right? Like loosely mentor. Mm. You don't have to actually yeah. go through any mentorships, but just have someone that's maybe higher skill level to help teach you. Um right. I also think that if you're not careful, you can have a lot of bad habits um or learn mm. a lot of things that are actually um, against what your goals are, are, are specifically for, for yourself and the industry. Um, if yeah, you learn course. through, through certain people. Yeah. I mean, like in essence, yeah, I think that is, I mean, it depends on the school. I mean, I don't know, I don't know too much about it. I don't know how involved they are, but I know definitely, um, you know, apart from maybe one lecturer in my university, every other lecturer had never, you know, most of them had left university and went straight back in and done a PhD and then they were teaching like straight away. You know, none of them had spent time in industry or jobs that were relevant. Um, you know, the one guy we had back who was a former student who wanted to come back to teach, he'd spent some time working on like a, a studio in Glasgow working on the Need for Speed series and, you know, which was great because, you know, he had some relevant knowledge to programs to use and how 3D works. So it was great, you know, because we had some kind of insight. But that's rare, right? Because most universities don't have anybody of that caliber because if they do then they're working right they're not teaching so it is hard because then you don't want people and it's funny as well you talk about you know cinema 4d and max and maya and zbrush and like they all have the relevance they're all programs that of course you know have importance in the industry and houdini especially i know is widely used but i feel the one thing that's been lost in the industry is the traditional skills like i've met like on a hand like i could count on one hand the many people i've met who keep a sketchbook who draw every day who are draftsmen you know who can pick up a pencil and like convey an idea competently and i think that's something that's almost in danger you know being almost gone forever when we enter an industry where or an age where especially like computers could do so much right you know like even with you know people who use uh you know and and again no badness to people if you want to use daz models to to pose totally relevant for reference like a hundred percent um but yeah, like I, I think like it was interesting because, you know, like I'll speak to certain artists who are like amazing at their craft, but then you find it like they don't sketch every day or they don't have a sketchbook or, you know, they don't really keep up their traditional skills. And then I'll meet some people who are like, like Scott Eden, for example. I know he is like hardcore, like you have to have a sketchbook. You must be drawn every single day. Like if you're a 3D artist, if you're 2D artist, drawing is so fundamental, everything you do. So it's like, again, it comes back to the conversation of, you know, everybody's unique because there is no one way to do it. There is no set path that's like proven for everybody. You know, like when I wanted to be an engineer and I went and done that path, you know, there were simple steps that if you followed, you will be an engineer. But with this, like there's no real simple path, right? Everybody has a different route. And that's like I say, versus the people who like burn their sketchbooks because they hate them versus the people who have like a hundred of them because they can't live without them. You know what I mean? the two sides of that camp i mean i don't know how you even feel about that like even on the subject of sketchbooks right do you feel like that's something 
you should be keeping regularly or do you keep a sketchbook regularly or yeah i mean i guess i'm not like so much of a of a purist in that way and that like i i think yeah people can they can sketch however they want personally like right. it it's however yeah. it's really i think it comes down to like the craft at what you do um whatever mm-hmm. it is right but um yeah. personally like i have plenty of sketchbooks i don't sketch all that often um mm. i think i just did like a pencil sketch uh like i did a couple days where i would uh sit down at uh the dinner table and i would sketch something while my wife was cooking and right. you know but like i think that was the first time i did that in maybe like two months three months like okay like yeah. I, I i really don't do it that often i i think i do it more generally if i have um less work on my plate but um right i mean i think when i'm when i'm working as much as i am now it's like mm-hmm. most of the work i end up doing even for personal projects is usually mm-hmm. um usually it's all done on photoshop and so right uh, and i work much faster on photoshop too so like course i i yeah. tend to instead i tend to prioritize my time and and decide like okay well if i'm if i have any time to work on something um mm-hmm. and i can be in the office right because uh, i have some time available still in the day then i might as well open yeah. up photoshop and try and get it done in that but yeah. um i mean at the same time though like the way that i handle drawing uh I, what I, one thing that i have noticed which is weird is like uh, other than mediums like i i suck when it comes mm-hmm. to mediums uh, with art is right. like i really can't do anything beyond maybe pencil or pen at this point um and right. because and even then i do the most like rudimentary things with it right i don't do any fancy shading or anything like that like um right and and it's just because the way i handle drawing in photoshop is so applicable and uh i i it's like there's no there's no disconnect when i go from photoshop to my sketchbook um because it's all the fundamentals that i'm focused on still but just i'm i'm holding a different pen is all um yeah but so i mean it it helps that like that carries over um Mm -hmm. into into that medium but uh Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's it's uh it's kind of dependent on on the type of artist you are i'm i'm not like a i don't know i'm not a a an artsy artist i should say i don't know if that's the best way of phrasing that but yeah well yeah, yeah. i like uh um, i'm not the type of person that puts a whole lot of uh a lot of thought and soul and and stuff into like the the things that i work on I, it's yeah. it's very much like fundamental uh technically based except for a you know occasionally like like I've been doodling Digimon lately. Like that's what I've been doing as my, like, this is, this is fun for me because I grew up with this and I want to draw these characters. But, but otherwise like, yeah, I don't, I don't put a lot of, uh, I I don't have a lot of uh, weight or pressure when it comes to the, to the things that I draw and and making sure that I'm, you know, being true to my artistic soul. I'm, I'm a fucking machine. I'm a robot. I don't care. Like, <laughs> just people hire me and I'll draw things for them, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, essentially, I think that's also the thing that, that is, well, there's two things, there's two things to pick apart in that, and that I know a lot of students think these things, and that's probably why people get lost so early, is that one is people think you need to be an artsy artist, right? To get anywhere further in the industry, you need to really, like, oh, you need to really identify your soul and, and paint the things that are internally taught. No, I mean, like, can just be seen as a job you know something to earn money to to advance you know and if you're really good at it great you don't have to be painting these huge you know self-portraits that study the mind and tear apart your soul like you don't you know if you wanted to do that i suppose then fine art should be probably more applicable to you right than the entertainment um but also i think when we were talking about sketchbooks and you were saying like you know i don't really keep it i occasionally draw i'm, I'm definitely no the under i'm definitely no the the thinking that you need to be drawing every single day for 12 hours a day you know like your sketchbook should at least be touched you know roughly every day like you should maybe try and do at least one thing like even if it's just like one hand or a head like something just to keep because like it is kind of muscle memory like if you don't draw or paint for a week you do feel it like you feel like you're rough or like you're unsteady like you're you're not quite there so it's like anything if you want you know if you want to be a pro athlete you would have to be training every day you know to, to an extent to keep that muscle in your body at the probably peak condition needs to be to, to perform at that level so what i'm saying is like 
I think the thing that students I've seen especially get caught up in the last time I went to the last year I went to university and I, I talked to some of them and worked through their sketchbooks is like they're super precious about their sketchbook right like they don't put anything in it unless it's like a finished amazing piece to them like they you know whereas I've seen people's sketchbooks who are like you know there's pieces of paper flying out of it there's stuff stuck in it you know there's yeah. like ra- random cuts out of a magazine that they've, they've put together some kind of face like a serial killer but like there's that level where it's got to be a place where you you explore you know like you try you know like i know people who are even like you know oh, i've been trying you know gouache or oils for a while and this is just my practice so i've like every day i just do a little portrait and try and see how it on but when they show it to empty like it's just for me and i'm like well that's totally fine that's what they're there for they're there for people to make mistakes you know like even somebody i knew who had like a really like i'd, I'd noticed on their, their kind of desk where they were working that this really amazing sketch would be like there's almost gold leaf at the side i was like oh, that's really can I have a look at that and she's like oh there's nothing in it like i just bring it with me i don't actually put anything in it and like every page was blank and i was like oh my god that's a sin like you know and i remember even when i was at university one of my my buddies david like he you know one time and i was you know the blank page is always scary right so i was like oh god i don't know what to draw so he was like all right can i see your book for a minute and he just got like a massive big sharpie marker and just like drew this massive big ugly squiggly line across two pages and he's like there you go something's yeah. done in it now. now it's messy and i was like oh you dick but then like at the same time i was like oh that's great like you know you've gave me like the the anxiety of the first page is gone because you've made it look horrible. So I don't care what the rest of it looks like. So yeah. So in the one thing I think people are very precious about, you know, like how they have to approach being an artist in the industry and also like their sketchbooks have to be pristine. I think that's like some misconceptions that, that definitely I've seen students make and even some professional artists, you know, like it's, it's interesting where you have almost two camps where people are like, you know, they come from a very traditional background, like traditional painters versus, people who like see it as like oh i want to work for league of legends or i want to go work in war, uh, you know world of warcraft like you know it's like it's a job it's a er- job in the entertainment industry you know you don't want to have to be this whole you know uh traditionalist of of art so um yeah i, th- I think i get what you're meaning where like is that kind of how you would you would describe yourself as that you you see it as more just like just like a job i mean i know obviously you put love and attention into things you do but for you it is like you know pay me money i make pretty art yeah i mean i to to touch on the sketchbook thing i do think that yeah it's it's a mm. it's a huge it's a huge mistake i think for people to view their sketchbooks as like too precious and that like yeah. I, the thing that i loved i loved before covid i guess doing was like if i went to something like a drink and draw not that i'd go all that often but if i did right um like i love seeing all the people that take it as like like this serious, like I'm going to do the thing that I do commercially, but in my sketchbook and it's going to look super pretty. And like, right. I would just do fucking a giant dick monster or something. Like I just don't <laughs> like, I love just doing stuff that is so not serious and making something like yeah. horribly ugly in it because yeah, yeah, it's not like, it's like you said, you have to remove that anxiety. Um, you mm-hmm. have to remove the idea of anyone seeing it or not care about anyone seeing it um and and remove and i think it's hard for beginners to get past that hurdle because you're trying so hard to prove that you are good or getting better yeah to so many people Mm -hmm. that it's hard to then reel that back and be like it's okay if i'm not good for this instance um yeah but uh but yeah i mean as far as like the uh, the career goes yeah i think i view it i view it more like a trade or like a skill right um and that uh not to say that we're basically like electricians because i think that uh, art is art in general is much more like that but i do kind of think about things like that and that you know we're essentially we're people that work on a a skill that we Mm -hmm. can acquire and get better at and get paid more to do and that skill is to be hired to do some commercial marketing art for some people or to concept out some characters for a game and like that's that's one way of thinking about it and that's i guess how that's how i think about like the jobs that i uh that i acquire that like are are handed to me or whatever um Mm -hmm. but i i i like to think of it too though as when i work on things for myself um it's a uh it's a skill that can kind of transcend into other other mediums right 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I mentioned that like I design board games in my spare time and stuff. And so like one thing that I do with that obviously is I'll do like art on the side for these games that I design. And it's like, I, one thing that it, that it has made me realize when working on my own games is like how incredibly grateful and lucky I am that I dedicated, you know, 10 plus years of my life to learning this skill that now I don't have to worry about hiring an artist or worry about getting the right art for a game. And that that's something that doesn't even enter my mind when designing something. And to think that when you look at all these um, board games that get created on Kickstarter or, or, you know, a lot of people complain about like traditional games and the, and the prices that they pay is like, well, that's because Mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't make all that much money uh, first of all, but also like, that's that's because they don't have those skills, right? Those indie developers pr- probably came from just wanting to design something and might not have any sort of artistic skills or graphic design skills or whatever that that kind of transcend into this other medium. Um, yeah. And so it's it's just great. It's great being able to it, it's it, and it's why like when I I met and talked to a few artists that like they get kind of like worried. You know, they get a big thing that I think people do to stop themselves from entering into sort of any industry or committing themselves to any sort of a discipline is, is they, they're scared that they, and they won't end up wanting to do it or they're scared Mm. of feeling trapped. Like, even if it's something they feel like they want or they want to get better at art or whatever, they get really concerned that like, once they're really into it and they're, you know, they, they learn the skill, they're getting the work. They don't want to be stuck there. They don't want to, they, they don't want to just possibly have to do commercial art for clients for the rest of their lives and yeah. i think that um the the way i see it is more so like well y- you would be obtaining a skill that could go into all of these other careers um yeah. and it's not just that you might have to do league splash art forever like you could become an independent artist you could end up doing you know fashion design you could do prop design like you could do all of these weird jobs that no one would ever think of doing. Um, and all just because you took that time to, to dedicate yourself to learning this skill or discipline. I mean, I think in essence, I think that's why I enjoyed you as a guest and also listening to you talk. I think that's how you've been so successful is that you haven't taken it super seriously. I think the fact that, you know, I mean, you're serious in the fact that you're professional, you know, and you can do these jobs for people and deliver them on time. But like, you know, you've almost treated it like play a lot of the times. Like like you said, you know, you've, you've never really thought about like, where am I going to work in 10 years? Or like, where's the next paycheck coming from? I mean, probably at one point you have, but you're more just like, well, you know, I suck at anatomy just now. Great. I'm not going to suck at it if I just keep drawing. Let's just keep drawing because it's fun. Fuck it. You know, like that attitude is almost the opposite thing i see to students you know who are like so concerned about where they're going to work or so concerned about the future or like so caught up and like oh man i can't draw hands i must like fucking bury myself in a shallow grave and never you know like that level of seriousness where they're having anxiety attacks because they're so worried about the future whereas like you know you are more just like oh this is fun let's draw hands and hey let's draw heads today and oh this is great and i'm going to draw lizard men and digimon and you know, you're keeping the fun alive in your craft, which I think makes you want to, that's why, that's the small percentage of people I've seen who get, you know, really good really quickly because they love what they do because they see the fun in it every day. You know, I mean, I definitely know, you know, when I left university, I was always like, I don't have a job yet or well, I did have a job, but like, I was like, well, well I don't have a real full-time job yet. Or I don't have something that's like concrete yet. Um, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Where I was like, you know, I was now I get up and think like how lucky am I to get up and draw for a living like or or 3D model or anything I do that's creative like how you know how great is that because I knew where I came from I came from like an engineering background where I had to go out in like the pissing rain in Scotland and dig holes in the railway like that was my that was my previous career before I left that to go out to uni so like you know now that I've flipped that switch and I think positively like how lucky am I I'll learn quicker. I feel like I've progressed more because I have that mindset, right? And I think that's why you're unique in that sense where like, you know, or rare that you've always looked at it like fun. You've always looked at it like an adventure or like, oh, this is so cool. Let's keep going. I mean, 
does that sound right or does that sound in the ballpark of where you are or I mean, my way off or i think that's probably how i view it now maybe anything that i learn now mm-hmm. i do it because i want to learn and i want to get better at this thing but for a long time it was definitely career driven is like I think right. when I was when I was really starting to take it seriously, um, I knew I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft and Blizzard games and stuff. And so I, my first goal was actually I wanted to be a creature designer or creature concept artist specifically. Um, OK, which is weird to think back on that now, but um, specifically for Blizzard. Um, and then later, I think it ended up kind of being like. I was drawing a bunch of characters and someone was like, it says here you want to do creatures, but you're only doing people. So like, why? And I was like, oh, I guess you're right. So I, oh. then I wanted to kind of like do character designs and then I wanted to be an illustrator for them. So, I mean, right. my, my big goals um, were always, my two major goals were always, I wanted to work for Magic the Gathering and I wanted to work right. for Blizzard. Um, and I mean... I think the first one I got was Magic the Gathering, and that was, oh gosh, when did I do my first Magic card? I think that was three, two or three years ago, probably. Um, okay. And I, until that point, it was it was kind of trickling in a little bit before that point, but um, up until that point, everything that I had done um, personally, for the most part, uh, for for art has all it had all kind of been building up to like i want to do this thing like this has been a goal i've set i think at that point it had been um at least 10 years and um the the feeling of striving for something um for 10 years and then acquiring it um my brain had like a complete meltdown um like i mean i i bawled my fucking eyes out when i got the job like and and it's just because like i i couldn't i couldn't comprehend it like i couldn't understand and and it came in like a sudden like a lightning bolt like hit me and i was like like, an email one day you're sitting at your computer and it was cynthia shepherd and you were like holy shit and what's happening yeah and it's just it's just it made me realize like oh my god this is something i've wanted since the beginning And it felt great to have it and great to acknowledge it, but it kind of felt almost like the end of a race. Um, And I didn't, and I didn't get that I was racing this whole time. I didn't get that I was like in this thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, Blizzard came, came later. um, And, you know, I, I was offered a position from them twice uh, and, Mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately didn't, didn't get it, but, now I've done Hearthstone mm-hmm. cards with them and stuff. So, you know, I've, I've done some work with them. But um, yeah, that, that first uh, finish line, so to speak, like it kind of made me, uh, it made me realize that like I could, I could relax a bit um, because yeah, before that, like uh, if you look at my portfolio um, back then versus now, it's like, it was drastically different. Like I, I had a bunch of, you know, super realistic characters or super realistic illustrations. It was all kind of Magic the Gathering esque, uh, or it was after Blizzard or whatever. And now, like all the latest stuff I do, other than obviously the client stuff that I post, is like it's all like weird, like maybe Overwatchy style, or it's like line art stuff. And it's just like I, it suddenly it felt like I wasn't tied down to this this idea or this pursuit that I was on for all these years. And now I could actually relax and like kind of think like what do i actually enjoy like doing right before right you know if i felt like i wanted to you know redesign bomberman like it would have felt like it was uh kind of like a, a pointless or useless endeavor right like oh well that's not going to bring me closer to my goal of working for magic and i don't think right. it's going to you know build up my my fundamental skills to creating anything in realism so i don't really mm. want to do that right now um right and uh yeah it wasn't it wasn't until then that i think i finally was able to kind of let myself relax and be like okay like it's probably okay <laughs> it's probably okay if i if i relax and i can and i can you know think a little bit more about like what is it that i genuinely want to do um not right. not uh, career focused not financially focused um just like what what do i enjoy um so, right yeah it's, yeah it's a very freeing experience yeah, I mean, like, I, I suppose 
I was slightly off in the fact that I thought you, you know, I wasn't trying to say that you didn't care about your career, but more that like you had a light-hearted approach to learning. Is now what I, I try do. To say, is now that, I do for sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that's maybe maybe because I've came at the end of the you know the end of the train. I've seen that you know whereas like like said if I'd known you five years previously, you know, I probably would have been completely different because you know I'm thinking to myself, oh well, you know, he's very dedicated to his craft, and you know, but then I I can understand you know even when I got my first job in university working for an indie company, like I also cried because when I left my job, you know, po- people told me things like, you know, you'll never work in a game. You'll never, you know, you'll never uh, finish university and get your degree. I've yeah. done all those things, you know, you know, I've had my name in game credits, you know, like I got that, you know, intern at one of the biggest studios in the world and stuff like that. So, I mean, I've done a lot. I've done this podcast, I've traveled all the world. So like, I think it's just been focused on a goal and try to achieve it as the thing that will get you through all your learning and making sure that you have that, um, especially with people I talk to against students who I say like make sure you've got a big end goal and just basically reverse engineer it like if like you said if you want to work for Blizzard well you know if I want to be an illustrator for Blizzard I, want, I need to know how to draw and paint and colour but like let's break those down into separate subjects let's study those at one point you know and try not to get overwhelmed by the end goal and just enjoy the journey because you know like you said it's took you you know before you got even magic stuff that was nearly 10 years so you know, like it, it does take a while it, it is a big pursuit you know and it is a very uh great end goal but it will take time so you've definitely got to be patient with the process and you know understand that you know you may have to spend six months um drawing and painting and you'll only see maybe like i don't know depending how much you do but let's say for average you know 20 percent increase in your skills um and you've got to be okay with that right you've got to be okay with the fact that like sometimes you'll only make small increments in skill you know it's not always going to be a massive jump but then one day like you say you'll probably paint something and then step back from it and be like oh holy shit that's actually quite good like you know i'm pretty pleased with that so um yeah i think it's it yeah (laughs) Yeah. maybe you'll eventually be pleased with it yeah, well, I suppose for a lot of people, you're never pleased, there. Eh? But then I think you've got to at least at one point look at it and be like, "Well, that's competent. Like it, it looks. Right. It's it's something know, that's, that's much better than what I used to do. Done previously. I've always said that to people, you know, because the one thing I hear constantly also is like, you know, um, oh, I go on art station every day and it gets so disheartened, and I'm like, well, one, don't go on art station every day, <laughs> but two, also you know use that stuff to inspire you and don't see it as like you know like i'll never be that good just be like oh well i will be good you know like that one day but you know um let's let's not focus on the rough and tough of like well i'm shitting you like i remember i told one of my friends thinking that he was actually going to compliment me when i was like um oh yeah i'm really shit at drawing and he's like well you are shit at drawing but one day you won't be so that's cool and i'm like oh, okay <laughs> like i didn't know how to take that was that a compliment was that not so like yeah i think it's 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 been it's been patient with the process that you know you're not where you want to be but then i'm like don't compare yourself to other people don't compare yourself to other artists and art station like compare yourself to a previous version of yourself like look at yourself six months ago what were you drawing and painting then like how have you came forward since then I mean, if you've made zero progress, well, of course, then you need to really address some issues that you're probably not practicing enough. But then if the stuff you were drawn like, you know, six months ago, with, I mean, when I left my job, I was drawing stick men, literally. I, I absolutely, literally stick men. And now, you know, I can throw together like, you know, a person and it looks like a person. So, I mean, you know, there's definitely like a growth there in the last couple of years and I can see it. So I think that's the best thing to do is to look back at you and think where you were six months ago and then look where you are now and then compare um so yeah oh the mic's getting a is it okay over there sorry it? yeah it is i uh i just now realized that this has been uh recording not the mic that's right in front of my face and instead has been recording the headset <laughs> mic. so uh it's a good thing to to see in uh, an hour and 18 minutes or so <laughs> it's a good thing to to, to notice now well fuck uh... <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the start of the Jalar Podcast. <laughs> we're, we're here with Forrest the Bell. <laughs> I mean, hope the uh, audio came in okay anyway. But I mean, yeah. I mean, if it's if it's okay to uh, to continue, I mean, yeah, of course. I, I think that the what you're saying about goals is is good. It's like it's weird because I'm I'm like a weird example of this because. Um, like I, I talked to my friend, my uh, another uh, artist friend of mine, uh, Gavin Valentine. He's an independent artist. He does a lot of, uh, did a lot of conventions and stuff pre-COVID. So, um, okay. But he, uh, him, and I talk about like the 
the differences between our career development um, fairly often because he wanted to work for Magic the Gathering as well. Um, he's a big fan of them, grew up playing their game uh, and stuff and wanted to go the illustrator route. Uh, and he was in a in a mentorship when his mentor ended up basically telling him, uh, looking through his sketchbook and pointing out these like doodles that he was doing. And he was like, these look like a hundred times better than whatever else like you're you're doing like why not just do this okay. like you clearly seem to enjoy doing this so why not do that um okay and so and he ended up doing that basically he ended up deciding like yeah like i actually really like working this way um mm -hmm. so i think i'm gonna do that so he never ended up working for magic the gathering but he kind of found his his calling so to speak in a different in a different format but right uh it's 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 interesting because like i when i became full-time at, at freelance um that was kind of the first like if i had armor built up you know of like i'm not gonna let go of of my ideals or my goals that i that i want to accomplish um mm -hmm. becoming full-time in freelance was the first kind of chip in that armor um right because it was the first i i, I no longer had to justify um my position anymore uh, to to right. people that that knew me personally, right? I never, I didn't have mm -hmm. to prove myself to parents or friends or extended family anymore, um, or people online. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like a, a a fraud a lot of the time um, for for trying to give any sort of like art feedback or career feedback, especially to uh, to other artists when I knew at the same time that my career hadn't quite gotten off the ground yet. And I know that's that's different depending on your own perception of it, but that's how I perceived it personally. Um, right. And uh, and it wasn't until I was finally full time and, and making money off of it and living, you know, just me and and my now uh, wife uh, on her own that uh, I, I kind of started considering um, other goals, other aspirations, because I knew like, okay, someday I'm going to accomplish these things. And if I do, then what, you know, like then yeah. what's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, if having this goal is what gives me motivation and encouragement to work harder on my skills, well then like, mm -hmm. I, I can't then relax. Like, like, what am I going to do? Like, and that's what happens, you know, like anytime that I feel like I've accomplished something and then I just don't have something else to do, like I go mm. fucking crazy. Like I need, I, and this, mm. this is probably how my brain works. Uh, I, I don't know if everyone feels this way. I know there's some people that are like, oh no, whatever. I want to relax. But like, yeah. um, you know, that, that's how I started getting into making, you know, board games and stuff in my, in my spare time is because like I was doing art full time. I was getting paid for it. That was a goal of mine for a long time. Um, mm. The side job after that, was building a portfolio for magic but really now that i was kind of on my own i was able to kind of think like well what do what do what sounds fun to me like it's not it doesn't always sound fun to me to draw it doesn't always sound fun for me to you know play this video game or whatever it's like i want to do something productive but that still is fun um mm -hmm. and and that's what ended up leading me into into designing games and stuff but and that's the thing is that i think goals can be malleable and i think that you can hold on to them i know i i held on to mine uh for a long time but it's like you know now that i've uh, done work for blizzard like fly like flying out to blizzard for two job interviews is like the craziest feeling to me and then get rejected yeah. twice is like it's such a it's such an insane feeling to go through but it's also incredibly like strangely validating where it's like, okay, like I had this opportunity twice and like, regardless of if it worked out or not, like it, it happened. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I don't know, it's like something about that is like enough for me. Right. If all I was looking for was validation in a, in an industry, like I, I feel like at this point I, I achieved it, you know, as much as I want it, at least like, I don't, I don't want any more. <laughs> I don't need any more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say because yeah, I mean, like the, the, a lot of the goals you've now achieved are like, like we said at the start, they're super high level goals. Like you know, like it's for some people, like the end of their career is working at somewhere like Riot or Blizzard or Magic the Gathering. Like they're big, big goals, and you know, it depends, I suppose, on your skill level. But um, you know, I've seen people get those jobs. You know, I mean, like even you know, Miles, Miles Johnson, you know, Miles, uh, 
when he worked for Magic, I'm sure he was like he was like 18 or 19 years old when he got his first card. Um, but again, he would have been the rule, no, the, you know, the exception, no, the rule. So, you know, for most people, those are big high level goals. But I think it's almost impossible now for people to look at those and think, well, how do I break those into manageable chunks? Because it seems like such a massive undertaking. Like, it's, you know, I'll never get there. I'll never be good enough, you know, because like there's so much work involved. But I think one person told me once he was like, you know, I think uh, William Lake, one of the guys I knew from uh, from Atom Hawk, you know, he was like, well, you can either get better or quit. Those are your two options. So, like, which one would you rather do? Do you want to quit? And I was like, no. He's like, cool, we'll get better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but then I think there's also a third option, which is stand in the middle for people and, like, do nothing. Because, yeah. again, it's, it's like the paralyzing fear. Like, oh, well, I'm not going to get good enough, but I don't want to quit. But then... I can't do the work because I'm so scared. And I think that is definitely like the, the biggest barrier for people is like getting over that initial thing of like, well, your goals are lofty, but then at the same time, you've kind of got to have something to aim for, you know, like even if like, you know, I've said to people like, if you make a portfolio for Blizzard and you want to work for Blizzard, but you might not get to work for Blizzard at that point, but then some other company hires you, you know, like King or, you know, some other company that has a similar style, then that's still a goal. That's still, you know, mission accomplished. If you're getting paid to be creative, that's always a win, you know. So then I feel like you have to work for Blizzard to be uh, validated as a person. You know, you can get that validation from not only yourself, but other companies, because there's plenty of people out there who now, you know, make stuff like Blizzard because Blizzard is so iconic. So, yeah. you know, you don't have to make things, even Riot Games, you know, there's plenty of companies out there who, um, no copy, but are influenced by Riot style, you know, because obviously it's, Riot sets the bar now for like game art, but then of course it's because they hire some of the best people in the world. But then if you know you're you're like eighty percent there, but no ready to work for them, then you can go work for somebody else until those skills are ready. You know what I mean? Um, right. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the options that I don't think a lot of people actually ever consider too. Is that like I I think you you see it a lot in the industry is, is um but that's the thing you'll see it in the industry but you won't see it if your your perspective of the industry is viewing these artists online like if you're only looking at the art idols that you that you love um mm -hmm. chances are those people they worked really hard for a certain level of of uh, if not validation because they they really want obviously to to achieve this higher skill level right they they love the pursuit mm -hmm. um or they were pursuing it because they want to increase their level you know as as much as possible yeah. and they fi they find that fulfilling um there are so many artists that work in this industry that people don't know about because they end up working at a at a studio maybe a small scale one but not all the time there's plenty of people at blizzard that people probably don't know about um right that uh are are good or great artists uh but are satisfied with the position that they're in um yeah and i think that uh some for some people it scares them i know that scared me for a little while uh the idea that like i might be working at this like one studio and kind of kind of feeling like stuck almost um yeah and and wanting to to grow or expand my career in some way but um mm. but at the same time like i think it's it's entirely dependent on your aspirations right and like what what you're after yeah. um and i think for some people uh the the pursuit of this type of a career is is an aspiration but it doesn't have to be the highest tier of that career right it's just you want to work in this industry because you would love to be able to draw for a living um or work on yeah. games for a living but it doesn't really matter, you know, if you're working on the absolute best game at the time right now, right? Because mm. as many people talk about working on, you know, for Blizzard or Riot or whatever, it's like now the top game is what we got Fortnite or Apex Legends and stuff. But it's like most people I yeah. hear about talking about working for companies is talking about Blizzard or Riot. And I think it's because right. of their background in, in art and their notoriety and stuff. But really, if you wanted to go for what tiering of importance, wouldn't you actually go, you know, to like Fortnite or something? But most artists yeah. don't don't talk about that in any capacity because, you know, they want to go for those like those. Uh, I think um, uh, historically, you know, the way that a lot of people were raised was off of these art idols that came from these these companies. Yeah, I mean, like I think also because when it came to games, there was only like, you know, a few 
industries or a few uh, companies that that were at the forefront of what they were doing. So you know, you only knew about the big, you know, the you know, that's more even like the Western companies. But if you look at the, you know to the east, you know, there was places like Konami and Capcom and oh, Sega. Yeah. You know, there was big companies. So I mean, if you're only looking at the big leagues, then of course, like you know, even I mean, there was a friend years ago who was like. Um, want to go to work in Japan and like his goals were set in places like Capcom and even Square Enix for a while because they were they were very Western friendly. Um, but I was like, you know, there's probably like you know three times as many smaller indie game companies across there that do just as valid work as like you know Capcom and stuff, but you can still go work for. So it's the same with Blizzard, you know, like especially in California, you know, there's you know there's a hub of games networks there that you know you go work for. Uh, who was the guys? There was a small team who worked on. Uh, the Slime Ranchers game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can't remember who they were specifically, but again, smaller company, you know, like the, the, there doesn't have to be just one or done. You know, even like in San Francisco, there's Double Fine. Like Double Fine are one of my favorite studios and I love Tim Schafer a bit. So, you know, I've got like Monkey Island tattoos covering my arm at the moment, but like, you know, uh, he's seen as an indie studio. His studio is seen as like a small scale studio, even though they're you know, now owned by Xbox, but you know, you could have worked for them and, and they have a very similar style again to most of the stylized work out there. So, you know, so yeah, like it's it's not a be an end all like you have to work for there and have to, you know, go work for Ma- even even breaking down Magic the Gathering, right? You know, there's uh Fantasy Flight, right? They they're another company who do illustrations for card games and they work for Star Wars and stuff like that. So even if you wanted to do fantasy card illustrations, there's multiple people who do that you know like even within the indie scene for like you know kickstart and back and stuff like that and projects there's so much out there even for illustration yeah. um and then even if you're a really good illustrator you know you might get to do book covers or poster design for something you know like you're not just limited to just working for games you know that if you if your end goal is games that's great but there is so much out there that yeah. you probably if you're good enough you'll find work anywhere so yeah i mean i do think that's true is if you're good enough and you're visible enough then people will find you and and hire you but yeah i mean i Mm -hmm. i agree with you is that like there's so many jobs that um i mean even jobs i've gotten that like i never once considered like oh this is going to be something i'll get hired for like that was god i mean uh speak i mean speaking of double fine like i one of the the first gigs i did through a studio through super genius studio was they were hired by double fine to work on uh the day of the tentacle remaster as well as the full throttle remaster Um, (laughs) so like i what but that's the thing is what the job was is Mm -hmm. opening up um adobe flash at the time Mm -hmm. And you would trace over the old pixelated frames. And that's what we Uh, did for months and months was only just frame by frame paintings of these old Day of the Tentacle characters. And it's like, I never once thought that would be a job I would do. Um, Certainly not one that, you know, I mean, that studio had to make upwards of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars just off of that one gig. Um, Yeah. And then, uh, well, I did I did illustrations for a Tasty Cake commercial, which is like a it's like a Hostess product thing on the East Coast oh, okay. here in the U.S. Um, yeah, like just just such like weird small things that you just wouldn't ever consider. I did I got offered to do uh, painted portraits of an entire esports team um, that, that oh, okay. ended up panning out, but it's like. It's just stuff like that that, like, I don't think anyone would ever predict that this could be a possible job that you might get in this industry. Right. Um, but yeah, if if you're visible enough and you have the skills uh, uh, acquired, like, um, or you make yourself visible enough, I should say, then yeah, right. I think you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get plenty of work that way. I mean, yeah, in essence, I think it's just the way of, of managing yourself if you want to be one of these people who is at the forefront and, and doing things. I mean, like, I know a question I used to get even last year when I done my talk at UWS and people were kind of asking me after the fact, like, what's the best way to get noticed by brands? What's the best way to get noticed by companies? Um, you know, where should I be posting my work? And it was actually even, it was even scary at the time when I was asking, like, people in the room to put their hands up if they knew what art station was. And there was, like, three people. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> but, um... But then the thing I say to them is that the way I've found it time and time, time and time again is that you can be super public, but if your work's not good enough, you know, people will pass you over for obvious reasons because it's a business. So, but then 
I've found that the people who are good enough like don't even have to really reach out and respects. Like if, if you're putting out absolute fire every day in art station, people in their flocks will come to you really quickly and be like, Can you do work for us? Because we really because I think the thing I found with industry is that, you know, it's not that there's like hardly any jobs, it's that there is loads of jobs. There's just no people good enough to fill them. You know what I mean? So you'll find that like in a lot of illustration cases, there's maybe like you know, say Riot, they've maybe got a pool of like, I don't know, 30, 40 artists that they constantly go to, but it's not like hundreds, you know, there's not like thousands of people they go to all the time who have like the skills to work at Riot. You know, it's like a small con- controlled group who have a really high skill set. So if you're super good at what you do, if you put out absolute killer pieces, people will people will hunt you out. They will, they will headhunt you because they need that, like almost on a, a constant scale. Because you know yourself, like with DLC, with new portraits for new costumes for for advertising stuff there's like there's so much stuff that needs done constantly yeah. you know f- you know um especially now because riots at the point where you know they've got animated series they've got card games jesus christ they've got game you know like there's so much stuff that needs art for it that um you know the 30 or 40 people they had previously doing splash stuff for league isn't enough anymore they need D- double triple that so um i mean i just yeah. got done doing it just came out today so that's how i can talk about it but uh mm. i got done doing a bunch of kda stuff for riot and that like i did okay i did a couple like illustrations uh for some event that uh, is going on as well as like i had to paint over like kaisa's face for some random it was like a one night like i quickly had to hop on and help another artist on on our team uh work on that and like it's Mm -hmm. just like yeah it's just random stuff like that that you wouldn't ever think of as being something that they'd need but um right uh yeah yeah i don't know it's uh it it's a lot for sure there's just there's just so much work right like that's what i'm saying that i think the fear is that people are like you know i'm never going to get work because there's only like there's enough jobs for like 10 people but that's not the case right Uh, yeah i think that yeah i i think that one of the um one of the misconceptions i mean so i i will say this uh 2d art jobs are among the most competitive for sure i mean that was even confirmed by i asked my recruiter about it at at blizzard at the time and he was saying that like that's those are the jobs that are the easiest to fill but also the hardest because they get the most amount of submissions that way but the submissions vary wildly between um like the the skill levels um yeah and and so uh, but that that's one of the things that i don't think people consider is i i do think that there is work out there like for a variety of skill levels you do kind of need to reach yeah. this minimum bar if you're going to reach any sort of you know like uh, proper uh, you know idealized uh, pay for for the work yeah. that you do but um but you touched on something when it came to to riot work in that mm-hmm. um the thing that I don't think a lot of people consider, I know I hadn't actually considered this um, until I was, I was in the thick of it, but when you're hiring for things like, like something like league splash art or, or league illustrations, or you're doing mm-hmm. marketing art for blizzard or whatever is um, mm-hmm. because they need kind of these top of the food chain artists. Um, mm-hmm. The the thing is, is that once, once you get to that, that top tier, uh, all those artists are busy because they're top tier. Yeah. Like, and yeah. so it it's weird because there there's a lot of times that we you know working with wild blue we we'd reach out to artists and and say like hey you know we really like your work we want to work on you on this project and they're just like oh well sorry like i'm busy like (laughs) and it doesn't even matter (laughs) that you know that you know the the tier of of work that we're offering or the pay we're offering or whatever it's just like it doesn't it doesn't matter they're they're swamped with work because they're very good and they're being offered all these jobs already so like of course they can't take this on um and so if that's the case like you need to then give artists uh, kind kind of like potential shots at um at, at doing this this type of work um right but uh yeah i don't know it's uh you'd just be surprised at like how many how many opportunities there are even at the highest of levels um there's yeah. way more at the lower levels that i don't think people consider mm-hmm. but even at high level uh positions like there are lots of opportunities for work um yeah. that that people wouldn't wouldn't even think about 
Yeah. I mean, in essence, I think it's, I had this conversation with an art director who runs a studio, I think even was it last year. And he was like, we're getting to the point now where we almost have to take juniors on and train them to be mids because like, you know, there's so many people, like you said at the top who are so busy with work that we just are running out of people to ask to do stuff. So we need to think about maybe try to build an internal team and taking people on who are like, you know, good, but have potential to be great. So we can then take them in and then hone those skills. And um, I think that's the thing I found a disparity between the engineering firms that I came from and, you know, looking at this industry now is that when I came out of my, so I went in an apprenticeship when I was 18 and I knew nothing about the job. I knew nothing about engineering, but for four years, they trained me to be an engineer um, and work in data centers. So, you know, that training was given to me as part of a government scheme where money was given to the company to help train me. But then also I got, you know, I got a qualification out of it. I learned how to do a, a trade, a job. So when I came out of the four years, you know, I could, I could work and, and do whatever. Um, and then even when you leave university to a certain extent in levels, like if you want to go into a firm, if you want to go work for an accountancy firm, you know, you'll have a basic understanding of accountancy because you've trained as an accountant, but then you don't know their particulars or how the accountancy world really works because you're fresh out of school. So they will obviously spend a time period training you and showing you, you know, how to do your job and how to interact with different systems and emails and all that kind of stuff. So in most industries, there's a period where people will be taken under the wing, you know, and shown what to do. But in their industry, entertainment specifically, there's absolutely almost none of that or none that I've heard of, you know, at that level where people are taken like straight out of university or like a very low level and then taken in and people spend time training them. You know what I mean? That's, you know, that's very unheard of, I think, in the industry. I mean, I could be wrong, but um, what do you think? There are programs like that in the industry. Um, there's actually a lot of programs um, that uh, benefit studios to take students straight from a, a college um i know super genius uh studios the first studio that i worked with they had a deal with um art institute that was kind of like that and that um not only did they kind of have the opportunity to go and look at the student work before uh, anyone else but um there was also yeah. some sort of benefits i think that they got if they were able to hire the student basically straight out of graduation um the problem right. is that a lot of the times the students weren't hireable straight out of graduation um, right. training programs are a little harder to come by. Those are usually only given to like top tier uh, or not given, but the, those are, uh, kind of, uh, and uh, no, I mean, they're, they're just usually an aspect of like higher tier studios. Um, so I right. do know that like Blizzard has training for their employees. Riot does arena net has them right. wizards of the coast yeah. does stuff like that. Like, um, all these mm -hmm. studios do generally have like some form of, um, if not like proper workshops, they generally will have live drawing or you'll learn just generally from the other artists that you're surrounded by. Um, yeah. But there is always that like that, that entry level, right? You, you kind of mm -hmm. still need to kind of have that, that at least for those bigger studios, you need that slightly higher uh, than average bar minimum bar in order to even get in there. Um Right. And uh, and then from there, yeah, you can you can learn a lot and you can progress quite a bit once you're in the studio. But um, yeah. but yeah, it's uh, you know when you look at those higher studios, they don't really have any lack of of resumes being sent their way. Um, and then the problem with smaller studios is that yeah, I don't think they offer the same the same levels of education. That being said, I mean, I I was given an opportunity at Super Genius, and like I mm -hmm. as as much as the work was not at all what I was trying to get into the industry to do you know i was working on mm. disney mobile games and stuff like that um yeah. i i learned a ton from from working there though just getting so much like in-house experience and so much experience with techniques and photoshop um that right. i still i still think about and i still use today i mean like it was more i was trying to say that you know there's probably people who are taken in at a certain level. Like you said, people come in, you know, I mean, the art center is probably also the, the the rule, no, the exception where, you know, or the exception or the rule, sorry, where like most people who go to art center and come out of their three or four year program are pretty high level. But then what I'm trying to say is there's no people in the industry that are coming in like, you know, that can draw or paint or do things to like, a, maybe a, like a, a passable level, but then they're overlooked in like, you know, like I'm saying with engineering, you know, even if you went through a couple of years in an engineering degree, you didn't go through an apprenticeship like I did. When you when you leave 
engineering school, you have like no practical experience. You've never worked in a firm or a plant or a machinery rig. But then when you're taken in by the the, the company, those guys will teach you all of that. Gotcha. Like they'll teach you all those skills. You know what I mean? Whereas with, with painting and drawing, you almost have to prove all that immediately before you even get an interview. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Blizzard's probably an example, but like any company, I think even at the lower tiers, you know, if you can't paint and draw to a pretty decent standard some people won't even look your direction you know what i mean like there's no there's no consideration for people to be like well you have the potential to be really good but then like we don't have time to train you you know we can't take the risk so that's what i'm saying i feel there's a gap there where you know if your option is like super expensive school and be in debt forever or like have to sit and grind for a year and figure it all out by yourself you know there's no a ton of options for people who want to get in and be super successful i feel like that's why I see so many people want to quit all the time or get really frustrated or get really upset is because there's so many thousands of people out there who feel lost, right? It's like a mist. There's just, and like we talked about this earlier, there's, there's now even a problem where there's like, there's so much information. What do you pay attention to? So like, I think because you have to figure so much out in your own, there's no like a ton of guidance. Um, I mean, there, there is and there isn't, right? If you know where to look, if you know certain websites to go to, then or forms to join or discords then a lot of that can be explained to you but it is pretty scary you know you know having to wander into that world on your own and figure all of that out for yourself that's a huge undertaking i feel in a world probably where a lot of people are handed things pretty e- easily and i don't know if that just speaks to maybe a modern society but do you know what i'm kind of going with this like you know yeah i do yeah um mm. yeah i mean i don't know i it's it's tough to say because I don't know if it's necessarily a fault of the industry or if it's just naturally that this is how yeah. things are going to unfurl in this way. Because, I mean, the different I don't know about how uh, how it would go with a resume for something like engineering. But, you know, right. a, as much as I can say that art is a is a trade skill that you can acquire, it's still something that yeah. you visually have to prove yourself for. You know, if, yeah. if I hire an electrician, I'm just trusting them that they are an electrician, you know? And so like, Mm -hmm. I'm trusting they're going to do this thing. But if, if it's an artist, you know, I mean, even talking about like hiring from, you know, Blizzard terms, it's like Blizzard doesn't give a shit about your resume. I, they give a little bit of a shit about resume. They, they don't care about like your cover letter. Like they just want to look at your art. Art is the first thing they look at because if your art's not good, the rest isn't going to matter. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, the one time that the quality of what you do is actually dependent on if you will even get hired or not. Yeah. You know, that's not, yeah. that's not consistent throughout most industries. And I do think it's something that makes ours a little bit more unique. Um, yeah. But I don't know if there's necessarily something that you can, it, it's, it's funny, you know, I just don't know if there's something you can change about the system in order to accommodate that because you could hire someone and give them a chance, you know, like I, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, even, even, you know, the studio I work with now, Wild Blue, like we, we've been, mm-hmm. you know, we, uh, we give a lot of our juniors, uh, uh, opportunities to try and like, uh, kind of flex their skills or try and improve their skills by, by giving them, yep. um, higher tier, uh, jobs and trying to teach them through mm-hmm. it. But, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's still like, no matter what, they're still good enough to do that junior level work. Right. But yeah, if, yeah. if you're going to hire someone that maybe, you know, maybe could intern, you know, is, is starting out and maybe could do some some light work here and there, possibly, you're then also yeah. trusting that they're going to take it so seriously that they are going to absorb all this knowledge and learn how to do these things. And um, yeah, so much of it is, is so, uh, yes, it's it's muscle memory. But so much of it is just this critical analysis of, of these fundamentals that are constantly, you know, going around in your brain um, combined yeah. with muscle memory. And it's it's yeah. um, it's just so much to try and teach someone and hope that yeah. they're going to see significant pro- progress. And, you know, maybe if I saw the results of more mentorships, maybe I'd, I'd have a different in- interpretation of that. I haven't I haven't looked at, at a whole lot of like before and after of certain mentorships, but um, of course, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It just it just feels like it's this inevitable uh, issue with the industry. Now, now the other side of things with that though is just that, um, you know, it, it it's kind of why I'm I'm grateful for uh, how naive I was starting out, is because right. 
if I wasn't as naive as I was, I, I probably would have. And it's not like I didn't have my freak out moments and worry and think like, oh, my God, should I get a real job? What am I doing? Um, like, I definitely had those moments for sure. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I had enough moments that was just hard headed, like, OK, well, I'll wake up and I'll draw warriors today or whatever. And like <laughs> after enough of those, you know, eventually you'll get somewhere. And I just trusted that process enough. But I know for some people, if you're not seeing results quick enough, um, or at least the results that you want quick enough, uh, it's hard to trust in this magical idea of progress um, that that somehow at some point you're going to be worth a certain amount of, of money to someone. Um, yeah. And then, of course, when that day comes, most people don't believe they are worth that amount of money. Um, yeah. you know, when, when someone finally does get a job offer that they've been working so hard for, uh, they, they don't believe that they deserve it. So it's, uh, I, I don't know. I was, yeah. I was going to say, was that your experience like doing your first magic card? Oh, I was so nervous. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, I, I was somewhat confident that I was going to do my absolute best on it. Right. Like I knew, like, I didn't know if the result was going to be the best uh, uh, results, I guess. But I knew that like I was going to yeah. put my all into it. Um, yeah. And I remember I, I ended up doing it and uh, kind of sending in a final. Magic's very loose. They, they approve like a, a thumbnail and then they just let you finish it. And, you know, that's right. it. Uh, right, okay. But I, when I sent the final in, I was doing a lot of smite illustrations at the time, which is a lot more, it's a lot different of like a rendering style. It's generally more yeah. saturated colors. Um, and that's kind of how this first card came out. And uh, right. Cynthia Shepard kind of sent this long email giving feedback and, you know, talking about the magic style and stuff. And I was just like, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. And so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I basically turned the whole image around and was like, OK, I got to make it look more magic. And and uh, yeah. I, I, I like it. I actually think it's still it's one of my uh, more favorite cards that the hex drinker card that i did is is the first one i did oh, okay um right cool. since then it's kind of been hit or miss on if i end up liking the results or not from from magic cards that i do um same same with hearthstone stuff that i work on now is like i liked my first card um the second one was okay the third one i did right. not like um <laughs> and, and now i'm working on uh you know like four more or whatever and uh i'm starting right. to like the results of these more so it's kind of like I worked really hard on that first one, trying to prove myself, probably overcompensate a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I, I feel somewhat confident, but then the results don't show and I fucking hate it. And then I try and relearn, you know, like how, how is the ideal way of making like a card like this? Um, yeah. And so and that's what I'm going through with like, with Hearthstone now, at least. I mean, I feel like with Magic and Hearthstone, it's difficult because, I mean, like, uh, so, um, oh, God, this is uh, James, James Ryman. I was trying to remember his name there. So yeah. James Ryman is, is a good buddy. And uh, James, you know, almost for a time tried to mentor me in, in certain aspects, but, I mean, I just wasn't, definitely wasn't hitting the marks. But then he is one of the few artists I think I've seen who can cross between, well, you, of course, as well, uh, move between uh magic and hearthstone because i feel like um there's almost two dramatically different styles to do like you said because a hearthstone blizzard it's like you know more saturated colors or more kind of cartoony almost but then or, or disney-esque but then like magic is like almost super serious and quite you know high fantasy so but when i remember asking james you know ages ago how does he distinguish between the two he was always like it's funny i get that question all the time but I just find that I can paint both styles and I never really feel like I've got to struggle to find either or. Um, do you feel like that's the same with you working on both Magic and Hearthstone? Have you had to really adjust between two of them? So uh, James, James is great and I'm super envious of, of that he can naturally flip between the two. I find it a little more yeah. difficult, but I also like, I'm really, really careful to try and, like if I get hired for a job, um, mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that I'm going to do the best in the client's eyes, right? Right. Um, and because as much as I could turn something in and I could think like, okay, you know, like this is this is good. I like this. I know on the client end, they could accept it and say it's good enough, but, you know, maybe they'll mm. do some tweaks on their end or maybe there's things that, you know, they, they might mention that just don't always get mentioned for various reasons. You know, it's, it's not important enough. Mm. It, you know, it's not... 
it's not critical enough to the image as a whole, um, or maybe there's just not enough time to to feedback this thing. Um, right. And so, I mean, since my first card with with Hearthstone, I make a really good point to um, to ask them. Um, like, okay, how, how is this? Like, what do you think about this? Um, is this matching mm. the style? Is this, is this how, you know, uh, the value should be? And, um, I, I'm learning like the, the specifics as to what, um, the, the art director really likes to see in their work. And so that's what I'm trying to kind of teach myself now is not mm. so much like, uh, you know, just, just painting the way that I I would like to paint, but how do, how do they like to see their images done um right and what is the ideal version of of what what their idealized version of a hearthstone image is um mm -hmm. and uh i and i do think it's funny because i do think a lot of what james does for uh, using him as an example still is like he he matches a lot of that style perfectly with uh with his work um and, yeah. and i think it's it's how he handles values is just a very good way of handling them across the board for card games in general um, yeah. and then I think uh, a lot of what carries over beyond just values is drawing. And because right. I know James is very good at drawing, um, yes. if he's given, you know, models in the same capacity that if I'm given models by, by Hearthstone, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. regardless of, of the exaggeration of, of proportions, you know, I, I know how anatomy works and how to, you know, construct things in 3d space and stuff. And so I don't have, um, as many, as many hurdles with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so from there, beyond just like the fundamental skills, it's what does the client prefer to see? And so I, I think that's kind of what I'm, the hurdles I'm currently going through with that client. And it's what I try to go through with every client. You know, I, I had the same right. instance with, um, you know, doing like my first uh, league splash art and stuff was just like a huge, huge learning curve, like figuring out like, like I thought for the longest time, like okay, they probably want you know very accurate drawings. Yes, they want exaggerated anatomy, but you know I think that they would want um, you know the forms to be sitting in space correctly, or they'll want the the mm. color and lighting like this. And like um, I was I was very surprised at some of the decisions that were made, and I agreed with all of them, which is funny. Right. I agreed with everything yeah. they said, but at the same time I was like, oh, that's not the way that I thought you guys would feedback this. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, like every company you start from, right, has a learning curve. And I mean, even when you don't like, it sounds so obvious, but if you've done, if you've never done a card for Magic the Gathering, you do your first card and it's, and it's wrong in a sense, or doesn't quite hit the mark, that's like, well, duh, that's almost expected, right? Because you've never worked on a professional image for that company. And even though you maybe know what you're aiming for, it can still be off because, you know, it's not something you've ever submitted to an art director, but then you did and then it was you know you needed to adjust so i mean like it, it, it's fine i think it's it's always the it's always the fear when people have like their first job and then this year their first gig or the first anything they're always kind of like oh what the fuck am i doing i have no idea but then you know fucking ding dong everybody's like that you know you even at your level now when you first started were of course nervous and, and like you know because i just discovered this tonight because i'm i'm seeing you probably at the peak of your career where you're like, oh, buddy, like fucking four years ago, I was a nervous wreck. And like, I, <laughs> I was also thinking about what am I going to do and how am I going to get this work for magic? But of course, now you have that work. And you, so, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's hard to tell somebody like the total cliche bullshit of, you know, oh, okay, it'll be all right in the end. And then he'll worry, you know, everything works out, you know, because I mean, for as many people as make an industry, there's just as many people who don't, you know, don't and might never make it. And, you didn't want to say that to people, but then sometimes it is like, it is such a hard, especially like you said, the concept and illustration, right? The bar is so high that it almost is not unattainable, but like it is so high level now that it's like, there's just going to be certain people who just can't reach that. Like, or, you know, but then again, it also depends on where you want to work and, you know, there's different companies to work for. So, yeah, I think when it's, it's no like, again, we came against this when we talked about engineering and other, and other disciplines, you could make a, a tutorial on how to do certain things as an engineer or certain things as you know a doctor or whatever but we are there's so many jobs within just art that you can't cover everybody in the whole industry because there's so many disciplines so i think it's just trying to stay positive and focused as much as you can i mean closing thoughts i mean do you feel like that's that's something that you try to convey when you stream or when you teach is that like you know it is a really fucking tough job but like you can do this I mean, I think anybody can do it. Um, 
I, I, I can't say whether or not anyone could get like, whether everyone could get to the top tier or not. I like to believe that that's the case. I don't know what would be stopping anybody um, necessarily right. uh, other mm-hmm. than just time and, and practice. But um, mm-hmm. I think the, I mean, what I always come down to is kind of like, what else are you going to do? Like, right. like you yeah. could, like, if you, if you don't do it because you think that you can't do it, then chances are the reason you're concerned is because you probably want uh, to get into an industry faster or you're worried you're not going to be able to get into this industry. So you'll find one maybe that you could work in differently. Um, right. Or, I mean, alternatively, you just sub- substitute doing it for doing nothing. Um, mm. But it's like, if if you have time and you're working on this thing, just like keep doing it. But obviously... <sighs> you need to be somewhat uh, self-aware. You need to be able to remind yourself um, of, of kind of how you are handling the pro the process of, of learning um, and going about this. Because the thing that frustrates me the most is if I see someone that's been doing this um, for, for 10 years, um, like 10 years is how long it took me before I ended up, becoming you know full-time and that had its that had its ups and downs you know a lot of it was Mm -hmm. i was in high school for you know four or five of those years or whatever um and uh and kind of you know i had my own little like do i want to do art i don't know but Mm -hmm. if i see someone else that kind of they've they've had their own 10-year journey and i don't really see any progress in their skill level over the course of you know at least like four of those years or something or like this this yeah, progress yeah, yeah. they haven't they made is not substantial um mm-hmm. they need to be able to take a hard look at themselves and understand like it's not because they're dumb it's not because they can't do this it's probably because of how you're learning you're probably not really actually absorbing the things that you believe you're absorbing um yeah and i think a lot of people too they end up getting in this trap of they believe that they're absorbing a lot of knowledge because they're listening to artists, they're they're talking to artists, watching a lot of tutorials, but the practicality of actually applying that knowledge and and you know learning it yourself, um, mm-hmm. I you know I just talked to uh, some friends about this uh, the other day and saying that you know the the two different ways of learning is either you spend hours and hours researching uh, how how to make let's say like a ceramic pot for instance right. You spend hours and hours and hours researching on how to make one single pot, and then that's what you do. You make one pot. Or you just, without any research, start trying to make as many pots as possible (laughs) Um, (laughs) and and see, you know, and learn by doing. And I think that no, it's not necessarily that like one is better than the other. It's that I think it's a balance of both, right? It's proper research with application. Um, And if, if you don't have that balance, like, I don't think you're going to see significant progress in, in the way that you want to see it. Yeah, a hundred percent. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a good note to end on. But uh, but yeah, because I don't want to. I mean, we could keep talking, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep you forever. But um, but we could definitely get you back on again, and, and we could talk about different stuff. Because I think um, with you being so high level, I think you've got a different opinion than me on certain things, and it's good to kind of go back and forward and, and see where we, we fall in the middle. But um, yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, if you're up for it, of course. But you know, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you oh, back dude. on and I'll, anytime. I I'm totally down to to chat about this stuff, talk about it, whatever. Yeah. For now, I really have to pee and drink some coffee. <laughs> I was going to say I need the same thing. Okay. Right. Cool, guys. Okay. So if you guys have listened to this point, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Forrest for coming on and speaking. Uh, if you guys have any questions or any comments down below, you can leave them as you know. I'll leave all of Forrest's uh, social stuff as well. You can check him out in his studio and his work. And uh, again, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. I uh, hope you guys are having a great end of the year and whatever you're doing. And uh, we'll speak to you guys again soon. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye.